Aloha kako and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our session is called Digital Approaches to Integrating Language Documentation and Reclamation with Olalo Hawaii. Um, I'm Hotli Leo Solomon, joined by two friends and colleagues of mine, Cedar, Cedar Lay and Danny Yarbrough. We are all PhD students in the Linguistics Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where I teach as an assistant professor in the Kauai Hoilani Center for Hawaiian Language. Today, we're going to cover a brief history of language shift and revitalization in Hawaii, the extent of documentation that Olelo Hawaii enjoys, as well as its application in the revitalization movement, and some examples of our own digital approaches to participating in that movement. Prior to Western contact, the Hawaiian Islands were populated by between half a million and one million people all of whom belong to the same ethnic group, spoke the same language across a uh, single archipelago that also represented a dialect chain. Hawaiian society was governed by chiefs until King Kamehameha I united all the islands under one rule. Olelo Hawaii was an entirely oral language that developed over the course of about 2000 years. Occasional contact with genetically related languages occurred during long distance voyages. Uh, and contact with non-related non languages occurred when trade routes brought ships, foreign ships into Hawaiian waters. Uh, the first company of missionaries arrived in Hawaii in 1820. Um, this was opportune because the passing of Kamehameha in 1819, the year prior, was shortly followed by the overturning of the kapu system, which was a system that balanced the power of the ruling class this left a nation mourning the loss of their king, uh, as well as a nation experiencing pretty dire turmoil, socio-political turmoil. The missionaries brought with them not only the gospel, but also literacy. Uh, literacy was regarded by the royal class with curiosity and enthusiasm after they realized that this technology was very powerful. Um, in a way that almost assuaged Hawaii's political woes, the gospel and written language precipitated in a wide, precipitated wide, widespread evangelization of the Hawaiian nation, uh, leading them to abandon the ancient polytheistic religion that was typical to Polynesia. Uh, by 1834, the first printing press opened on the island of Maui for about three decades solely ecclesiastical content was printed in these newspapers and then by the early 1860s secular presses opened and began printing diverse content across a wide range of genres this sparks great interest among the hawaiian people <clears throat> by the middle of the 1860s several presses were publishing several newspapers several times a week the extent to which the hawaiian nation engaged with their national newspapers created a dialogue that provided readers with content from all over the world, resulting in an impressively large corpus of what we're calling today endo documentation, a historical record produced by Hawaiians for Hawaiians. The breadth and depth of the textual documentation, unfortunately, stands inversely to the decline of the oral tradition of the language. Uh, warnings of language shift began as early as the 1870s and spread so quickly that by the end of the 19th century, all Hawaiian schools, Hawaiian language schools, had also closed. Uh, this closure was on the heels of the passing of Act 57 in 1896, mandating all education in Hawaii occur in English. This sharp decline of uh, Hawaiian language speakers greatly motivated the uh, documentation, textual, textual documentation that characterizes about a century of record making by our ancestors and our forebears who realized the impending doom that the language faced, but also who mobilized to leave a legacy of literacy that would one day help to revitalize the language, even if decades later. Uh, shift away from um, Olelo Hawaii trended well into the 20th century until the early 1970s when a period occurred that would become known as the Hawaiian Renaissance, renewing pride surrounding Hawaiian cultural expression, such as dance, music, arts, culture, identity. The linguistic revitalization began in the form of interviews with native speakers of the language. Uh, while the Hawaiian language education campaign will celebrate its 40th year in 2023 next year, linguistic attention has not always contributed to the forward movement of the campaign. Um, 
in spite of the widespread recognition of the success that the movement has achieved, most studies that regard Olalo Hawaii have ignored the kuleana that we believe all researchers should have when doing language work and linguistic research. Now, to explain this word kuleana, we offer the word reciprocity. Although that's not a uh, complete on the nose English translation, uh, it fits here because kuleana means both responsibility and privilege in the sense that one should only claim their entitlement to something if they have already shown a commitment to their obligation to it. Uh, this in essence parallels a framework for research, especially with indigenous communities or in indigenous communities that was theorized by Kirkness and Barnhart, who named the four R's, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. Uh, we recognize and adhere, to the, uh, and adhere to the importance of these cultural values and the work that we present today, especially the work that my colleagues are gonna say, going to present today. So I hand it over to Cedar to uh, show us our first digital approach. Okay, mahalo ha'a. Uh, so these reciprocal digital approaches that Alilio mentioned really culminated in two projects. Uh, the first, which I'll speak about now, is the Apapane Me Ka'ohia, or the Bird and Tree Game. And the second, which Danny will talk about afterwards, is the animated Mo'olelo O'ivi, or Traditional Stories. Uh, but turning now first to the Bird and Tree Game. So this is essentially, it's an interactive digital collection of Hawaiian language lessons that were developed directly from a documentation project, which adapted the Max Planck Institute's Man and Tree Stimuli, uh, which are very widely used for studying spatial orientation cross-linguistically. Uh, the link to the website is below here. I encourage you guys to go ahead and take a look. Uh, I only have limited time here to talk about it, so I'll only be able to show a few examples. So I do encourage you to take a look yourself and really poke around. Uh, so this project really began as a pilot for a documentation project where we wanted to create culturally and regionally relevant uh, versions of the man and tree stimuli for linguistic research on the Hawaiian Islands. So we could use those to study Olelo Hawaii in ways that are actually relevant to the people we're working with in the community. And then uh, it evolved into a revitalization project as an interactive digital pedagogy for Olelo Hawaii learners, which was developed alongside the very same community members who were involved in that original documentation project. So on the left here, you can see the Max Planck Institute stimuli. Uh, they have the plastic toy man and tree um, appearing in different orientations to elicit language data on spatial orientation. However, you know, this is not necessarily what trees or what people look like in certain regions of the world, in our case, in Hawaii. Um, and so we wanted to create what we came up with on the right here, which is using the Apapane bird instead of the man. So this is a bird that we decided to go with because it's commonly seen on the islands. It's commonly seen with the tree that we chose. So it's kind of natural thing to see in the environment. And also the Apopane is believed to be a kino lao, so a body spirit, which represents a number of Hawaiian deities. And then the tree that we used is the ohi'a tree, uh, which we went with, again, because, you know, the, the nectar on the tree is actually what the Apopane bird feeds off of. So it's commonly seen together in nature and also holds significance in indigenous Hawaiian worldviews. Um, it's believed that Pele, the fire goddess who actually created the Hawaiian Islands, uh, was in love with a man named Ohia, and that love was unrequited. So out of spite, she turned him into this twisted, gnarled Ohia tree. And originally, uh, we had what you have here on the left, um, but in Olelo Hawaii, they actually discuss direction in terms of uh, Mauka, or mountainside, and Makai, or uh, seaside, or oceanside. So when we developed this into pedagogy, we fixed those bearings in the background. So you have the mountains on the right side, the ocean on the left side to keep that kind of universal for everybody who is viewing this worldwide. And finally, excuse me, uh, we took that and we developed an interactive digital web page using the bird entry cards for various language lessons. So you can see there on the right, uh, the learner can hover the cards with their mouse, causing them to flip and reveal a description of the scene. And depending on the lesson they select, there's a number of lessons on the website. Um, this one in particular is for locatives. So the locatives are actually left blank on the backside of that card. And um, language learners can use that to practice their understanding of locatives. They can do this for various different um, types of segments and different lessons on the homepage of the website. 
Um, and again, the website link is there. I encourage you guys to go ahead and take a look yourself, see what it's like to interact with it, engage with it. Um, but anyway, with that, I will go ahead and hand things off to Danny to talk about other digital approaches that we have taken. Mahalo, a -seater. Um, I feel like I'm going to echo a lot of what my co-presenters have said, but I'm going to walk you through our last case study, which is an animated mo'olelo oivi, or traditional story, called He'e Me'iole, the octopus and the rat. Um, so this project, um, some background on it, it was conceptualized in a language acquisition course. And it was a really great mix of both native and non-native students from different linguistic backgrounds and linguistic subfields with people interested in language revitalization, as well as experimental methods and um, indigenous language revitalization. So this led to some amazing conversations. And um, of course, we had many different decisions we had to make, but the first one was, what language should we make our pilot study for? And Hawaii is a diverse linguistic landscape. There are so many languages and so many different groups we could have focused on. But when we took a moment to step back and really think about it, we were like, you know, we're living and studying on the lands of the Kanakamali, the Hawaiian people. Um, so it really is our kuleana to support Olelo Hawaii reclamation efforts. Um, and Ha'a touched on the importance of kuleana and reciprocity in the introduction. So once we had chosen to work with Olelo Hawaii, it really elevated our, our thought process on how we're going to design the study. And we wanted to take a cue from Indigenous language education and choose a story. So I have a quote here by Archibald, which I think really encapsulates the importance of stories as a teaching method. Um, so stories have the power to make our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits work together. When we lose a part of ourselves, we lose balance and harmony, and we feel like the coyote with mismatched eyes. Only when our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits work together do we truly have Indigenous education. So we knew we absolutely wanted to focus on, st on stories because of their holistic approach to Indigenous language revitalization and as an Indigenous um, pedagogical technique. So um, we made that decision, but of course, linguistically speaking, stories are wonderful. We have so many grammatical structures that appear in them, vocabularies, narrative structures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was really a great decision that benefited both aspects of the project, um, linguistic and community-based. So we chose to focus on syntactic patterns acquisition for our linguistic focus. And we had to choose at that point what story we were going to use from the Bukui, Green, and Zane book. Um, so we chose He'e Mayoli because of the location. We were choosing to work with Kamakao as an immersion school located in Kaneohebe, which is where the story takes place. Uh, so you can see in the first screenshot, we have Kualoa and Mokoli'i. And in the second, we have Iole, the rat, looking from Mokoli'i onto Kaneohebe. And that is where the immersion school is located. So when the kids got to watch this animation, they're like, hey, I know where that's at. That's where I'm at. That's where my school is. So it gave them a way to really identify and bond with the particular story we were using. And of course, again, that holistic approach, it wasn't just about the language structures um, or the geography, but also things like material culture and indigenous technology. So we have the Luhe'e, which is the traditional lure used to catch He'e. It's explained in this story. And then of course, Fa'a makes an appearance, the kanu, um, an essential part of Hawaiian culture as Ha'a mentioned in the introduction as well. And then finally, there's going to be a little clip here playing. That is the assessment version that we made of the animation. We made two. One that's assessing the student's comprehension when Pua asked them questions about what they heard. And then we have a non-assessment version that's available to the public for anybody to use. And um, that's linked here at the bottom of the slides. So feel free to check that out um, on your own time. Um, but the design of this study was really collaborative from beginning to end, and I believe that's why it was such a um, great and productive and useful project for both linguistics and community efforts. You know, we had the design in our class, production, we had Hawaiian language instructors voice the characters, and of course we gathered lots of feedback from Kamo Kao Immersion School and then the UH Manoa classes we play tested it in as well. I know it was a whirlwind of information. It's such a short time slot, 15 um, minutes, but we wanted to wrap up by saying that linguistic research and community-based language work can and should be done in a collaborative way. It really needs to meet the needs of all of those involved. And um, we encourage you to explore the ways in which these methods might facilitate your reciprocal approach to your next project. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Our contact information is listed here on the last slide. So mahalo me ahui ho.